Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television. On The Point of View, we pick the right topics, we get the right guests, we ask them good questions, and you usually learn something. It's live and interactive. We have a special double barrel show for you tonight. In the first part, we're going to give you a 15-minute overview of what happened in a very significant day at the election petition hearing. We'll tell you what happened and what it means. Later on, we have a city exclusive, a preview of the vetting of the president's ministerial nominees. It's happening on Wednesday, and we'll be jumping into some of the key questions. There are three issues. So who are the people on the panel? For the first time, it's split right down the middle. What questions are we anticipating will be asked? And are there any of them who will probably face more trouble than others? All that and more when we come back. Stay with us. So welcome back. So tonight we're going to start with our touch screen. We're going to take you to the Supreme Court and show you a summary of where we are so far. We think today is a very significant day in the case because this is the end of the petitioner's case. He presented three witnesses and we are at a very important junction. But it appears something happened which was more like a curveball to walk us through where we are. I'm going to bring in our correspondent at the Supreme Court, Sixtus Dong Ulu, LLB, who's been in court. How many days, how many court days have we had? Sixtus, welcome. Thank you, Bernard. Um, in, in all, we've had some five, six court days mm. effectively listening to mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the case as being presented by the petitioners. Fantastic. Mm. So, wh where are we in the case? And just walk us through, even before happening today, where are we in the case? We are, as you, you said in your intro, a very critical point of the case where the petitioners have effectively closed the case that they submitted to the court. They went to the court with a, a number of concerns, and all the concerns were narrowed down into five legal issues. And so the court was invited to uh, determine these five issues. They have pre presented their case Three witnesses. The first person we had was uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, Ketia, General Secretary of the yes. NDC. General who, Mosquito. General Mosquito, there famously is. called, mm -hmm. who is also seen to be a coordinator or the coordinator of the NDC campaign presidential parliamentary in the 2020 election. So he was the first witness. He was the, the very first witness. And he sought to do a number of things with his testimony. Uh, one of the things he did was to question the figures that were put out by the Electoral Commission. In that testimony and the cross-examination that followed, we saw the effort by General Mosquito to say that at the point that the Electoral Commission and the chairperson of the commission, who is the returning officer for the election, went out to make the declaration on the 9th of December, there were still critical anomalies that the chairperson should have consulted stakeholders on before proceeding to uh, do the declaration. Again, the general secretary sought to make the point with his testimony that with all of the happenings we saw on the 9th into the 10th and again on the 11th of December, the chairperson of the electoral commission who is returning officer for the presidential polls, did not conduct herself within the dictates of the constitution from which the commission draws its mandate. Mm. And so it's questionable and should have some pronouncements on that by... So those are the, the two main issues he raised. He raised. Now, if you look at uh, Dr. Pesa White... So just to be clear, he is the general secretary, so he ran the election nationally for the party. Mm. Now, these other two men were in the strong room. So these other two men were in the strong room, representing the flag bearer of the party and by large the interest of the party. Okay, now you are the yes. uh, correspondent for the EC. When, when we say the strong room, it's not in the constitution. What is the strong room? The strong room is basically a coinage of the, uh, the, the players, the parties in this. Prior to uh, la 2016, the 
it was known as a strong room because it was exclusive to accredited personnel from the various political parties and observers who were there to monitor the process, ensure that each interest was represented. Now, in 2016, we had a deviation or a change in that uh, dynamic. We had the then chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Charlotte Osse, championing what was called the National Coalition Center. And the idea was to break this whole uh, jinx that was around, the mystery that was surrounding the concept the so of a strong room, room okay. so that people didn't have to perceive the strong room as some room where so was it, people was go it, to fight. Was it abandoned or they just decided to change the flow? Of they the just decided to change the flow. Okay. So you still had the room where the collation was done, mm -hmm. uh, figures added, subtracted, discussions had over figures that were coming in from the regional and constituency levels. But then you had a more open okay. process than So what did was. Mr. Pesa White say? It is in two, two paragraphs. So looking at the testimony of uh, Dr. Pesa White, it was simply to say that the chairperson of the Electoral Commission indeed did not allow the process or facilitate a transparent process. And that fed into the testimony of uh, General Mosquito, as, as we had heard earlier. And today... Uh, in court, we had the third witness, Rojo, uh, Rojo Metelnunu. Metel there also, he there he is, also corroborating. And he did this by video conference. That. Exactly. Good. So let's let's look at what happened today. So it's mm. two big things happened. Rojo was cross-examined. It took only one day. We, we thought it would be longer. It was very short. It happened at close around one o'clock. Yes. If you look at uh, Mr. Metelnunu's testimony, this centered around the conduct of the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, returning officer on the, the night of the declaration, or the day of the declaration, 9th December. And some of the questions we had heard Dr. Pesa White, uh, you know, raise regarding the conduct. And if you recall, there were journalists who said, uh, why didn't we have this person testify? Because himself? he was the one who because allegedly the chairperson spoke, spoke to, to, and not Pesa White. A lot of the interactions revolved around him. And so he was there to answer some of those questions that people had and thought were... So what was the highlight the, of Rojo's testimony today? That the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, number one, did not grant them the needed audience to facilitate consensus building in the build-up to the declaration, that the, the, the chairperson hurriedly, you know, declared the results, and so the, the processes had not been exhausted. Okay. And again, you can look at the... Uh, aspects having to do with the, the deceit or mm -hmm. the conduct of the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, whether it was in good faith, mm -hmm. whether there was some predetermined intent to declare the elections so in favor of the understand So is it understanding party. that the petitioners are saying the EC chair in asking them to go and consult their candidate sort of tricked them or sort of they, they, were, they left the strong room at the critical time because the EC chair had assured them that upon their meeting their candidate and coming back, they will resolve the issues. Exactly. In, in, indeed, that was something he particularly said, Mr. Mm -hmm. Metulunu particularly said, and that they relied on the good faith mm -hmm. they had in the, in, the, in the person or character of the chairperson of the Electoral Commission mm -hmm. to believe that they could go have their discussions with the leader of the, the party, come back, discuss the outstanding issues with the chairperson of the EC before the results were, so were what, declared. So what was the, the respondent's approach? What, what did they really want to do with Rojo? If we look at the critical cross-examination we saw, which came from the, the lead counsel from, for the Electoral Commission, this was simply not a credible witness. That's, That's the, just the, the, point. Um, yes. That this uh, witness, together with Dr. Pesa White, they failed in a duty and they merely wanted to hide behind uh, their, their, their petition to uh, cover up their own feelings. They are, they are failing in protecting the interests of the this The interest man. of the former the president, petitioner, the Mr. Petitioner. Mahama. Yes. Okay, so just walk us through this. So, Rojo finished his testimony. The petitioners closed their case, meaning that they've brought all their witnesses. Mm. So what happened after that? 
naturally, we were all expecting that the, uh, the, the first respondent, That's the a trust formation, would uh, you know, also put up the uh, returning officer, Madame Jean Mensah, to get into the box, as they know, are go through as they are because witness, they have submitted a witness a statement. witness statement. Again, we're expecting. So just to be clear, so to clarify, so it looks like in court, before the person comes to speak, what they will say has been put on paper, written That's a already. Witness statement. Exactly. So everybody was expecting the chairperson, the EC, to come and speak to her witness statement and, and be cross-examined cross on, on, on scene. That was the expectation. Exactly. And then what happened? But we, we got a bombshell. The, the lawyer announced in court that we do not intend to call up any witnesses because the petitioner had already made a case sufficient for determination. Indeed, he said that the evidence adduced by the petitioner was sufficient to, uh, to, to aid the court in determining the issues that had been raised. And so they did not see the need to uh, present any witness. This man was not happy with that. At all. So what did he say? At all. He says, he, in fact, he questioned the move. He, he says, it, 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 it's not possible. <laughs> you have already submitted a statement. And on the strength of that statement, we have an indication that you intend to call up this particular witness. So you cannot suddenly say uh, you, you won't present the witness. Indeed, in his words, the witness is running away from cross-examination, and the witness cannot be allowed to run away from mm. uh, that cross-examination. So there was a bit of a and back so and forth in court today. I'm told tomorrow the matter will be, is the matter will be determined tomorrow, the matter will be debated tomorrow, because there's a bit of debate today. So what we are expecting to see tomorrow is the legal arguments from the two sides. So the EC's lawyers will present their argument on why they do not have to present a witness. Uh, President Akufuado's lawyer will present arguments, legal arguments on why they do not have to, and then we'll have the objections from uh, former President Mohammed's lawyers, Chachuchi Kata, and then the court will decide on that whether or not indeed we should get the witnesses at least, mm. the statements. So, do you get the impression that, that the, the so petitioners far? are more interested in Mrs. Jean Mensah than they are in Mr. Peter McMenu, who's the witness for the second respondent? It looks like all of this rests on Jean Mensah. Indeed, that's a question a lot of us had, and we, we had the opportunity to ask the, 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 the lawyers for the former president, but they didn't seem to want to even answer that question, that to say that they have a case with or without the testimony and cross-examination of Madame Jean Mensah, they have a case. But you would also realize that a lot of the things that had happened in this build-up you know, rested on responses from the Electoral Commission. So you can be sure that Mr. Chachu Chikata has a lot of questions. Recall the interrogatories that were struck down first as a request and second as an application. And a lot of these things, you know, were questions that were supposed to have aided him in, in the presentation of his um, evidence to help the court determine the issues. And so, obviously, he wasn't happy. And he expected to be able to have Madame Jean Mensa in the box so he could just, uh, ask okay. her some of those questions. Just finally, during the initial arguments of Mr. Chikata, we had a lot of the judges questioning back and forth. Mm. Is, does that give us any sense of how their thinking is about this? Did they seem surprised by the move, by the uh, respond, first respondent to say, we don't even intend to bring our, our, <laughs> our witness? Or this is fairly, I mean, I'm not asking you to sort of prejudge, mm. but just based on the way the arguments went, what, what are you expecting tomorrow? They were surprised, and the CJ said that, and Inyabua said that. He said in open court that we on the bench, we are surprised by this move. And obviously, Chachu was also surprised. And so they are expecting the legal arguments to guide them mm. in, in, in determining whether or not the, the, the respondents mm. should present witness. But also recall that there's a thorny issue of whether or not you can compel a witness to give testimony. It's one of the questions that came up. We saw um, Justice Tokuno ask a question in that regard. Mm. And so, yes, the, the bench was surprised by the move, and they openly said so. And so I'm sure that they will be relying heavily on the argument that will be made mm. uh, tomorrow to be able to take Fantastic. a decision on wow. that. Great job. Thank you very much, Sixto Don Ulu. This is still the point of view. We're bringing you a special show. Just a quick summary we brought you of the proceedings on day 11 
of the hearing. When we come back, Wednesday is a big day in Parliament because the President's nominees for various ministerial positions would be vetted. And we have a vetting committee or the appointments committee split right down the middle. Duke Mensah Foku joins me with some very interesting analysis of who the people are on the committee, who the people the president has nominated are, and what questions will be asked. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is still the point of view. And tonight's a double barrel show. First part, we showed you highlights of the case election petition so far. A very important juncture. Big, big arguments tomorrow. We'll be there from 9.30. Now, on Wednesday, the Appointments Committee of Parliament will be very busy. Now, we want to show you three things. Who are on the Appointments Committee and why is it important? Because this is the first time you have a committee split right down the middle. Second issue, who are the people to be vetted? We know them as ministers. What's their background? What do they do? What have they achieved? Where are their failures? And more importantly, what are the potential questions that are going to come? For that, I have our parliamentary correspondent, Duke Mensah. Duke, great to have you. How are you doing? Good to be here, Bernard. Fantastic. Great. You've covered parliament for a few years. Yeah. It's fair to say this committee is unprecedented. Yeah, very, very unprecedented in terms of its makeup, in terms of its composition, and in mm. terms of even the circumstances that characterize its composition. Mm. So parliament had a very heated debate. We are told the debate started from the committee of selection. Mm. And the committee of selection is the committee, as the name suggests, that selects com members onto various committees of the house. Mm -hmm. Now, the the, the, the brouhaha was over the numbers. Mm. Now, we know this parliament is... As in the split. The split. This How many people on the committee? 26 members. Wow. Yes, yeah, so now the, the, the um, standing orders of parliament, order 172 says that the appointments committee shall not be made up of more than 25 members with the first deputy speaker as the, as the chair. So 26 members. Now, the argument was whether the first deputy speaker should be chair and member as a member Whoa. of the majority or should stand alone. So that was one of the issues of contention. But after a back and forth, they agreed. So 26, 13, 13. 13, 13. This is the first the, time. Can the chair vote? He has to vote. Amazing. Yes. So who are the key people we should look out for on the committee? So there is um, Joe Weiss. Uh, Joe Osei was the first deputy speaker. Thank you for Bekwai. Bekwai. There is Harunai Idrisu. He's the minority he's, leader. He's the minority leader. We should look out for him. Mm -hmm. We should also look out for... Um, Afenyo Markin. The first time he's going to be on the committee, okay. but he'll be there as a uh, deputy chair. Okay. Yes. Then there's also going to be Mohamed Muntaka Mubarak. Is the majority chief whip on the committee? No, he is not he's on not the, the committee. I'm not on press, not on the Who, committee. So you have, you have uh, on the leadership side, Muntaka. Muntaka is there. So Haruna and Muntaka on the, on the NDC, NDC side, side as the key people yes. to look out for. To look Why out are they for. important? Well, because of what they, the kind of, you know, questions and the kind of death they brought to the vettings in the last parliament. Okay. Um, mind you, in the last parliament, the appointments committee had 25 members, of course, 10 from the NDC, 15 oh. from the MPP. So it's now 13, 13. 13, 13. Usually they give the leadership more time. More time. The, the leadership can ask as many questions as possible. Mm. So remember, Munt uh, Muntaka at least takes one hour to ask his questions. And his questions are very probing and very piercing. Usually he asks questions that borders on the background of these guys. And mm. sometimes even some scandals that they may have been involved in. So Muntaka actually does a lot of so that. So in terms of leadership, Haruna and Muntaka will have a lot of time. A, a lot of time. Joe Wise is Joe chair. Apenyu will have a lot of time. time. But because the ministers are from the MPP side, right. he wouldn't grill them too much. Yes, and, and, and usually Joe Wise as chairman comes in when he thinks that he has to preside and be the okay. chairman. He usually doesn't ask a lot of questions. On the MPP side, I saw Obi Amwa. Yes, Obi Amwa is there. And then we, we have on the NDC side, yes. we've seen Suhini, yes, Suhini, Ablakwa, and Ayariga. Suhini, this is Suhini's second time, second term, and yes. this is the second term on the committee. He's also known for asking a lot of questions based on it, on the background of the appointees. He's a journalist. Maybe because, yes, he's, he's, Whatever you he's said, a journalist. You it. But and it's also part of the triumvirate. The triumvirate himself, Okujoto, Ablakwa, and Ayariga. These three guys. Oh, the Trinity. Yes. What, what, what do they do? <laughs> well, because of how they announced themselves on the committee, especially himself and Ablaka. Remember the Boacheja coincident? Mm. You know, the last, the, the, the allegations of bribery in, in, involving Muntaka and the rest. Of course, they've moved on from that. And also remember um, the, or the near coalition calls between um, Alas and Suhini and the chair, chairperson during the vetting of Kenoforiata over some offshore accounts and the rest. So when it comes to issues regarding background research and going into the backgrounds of the appointees, 
So he has made a name for himself on that committee. But we also have people like Esla Ousu yes. on the majority side. Yes. We have Obiyamwa. Obiyamwa. She's, she's a nominee. She's a nominee. And which, she's also on the committee. Which, is also, which also is going to be, which, which, is, which might be prove a, a disadvantage for the majority or the MPP. Because Order 172.8 says that an appointee who fails to garner more than 50% of votes on the committee is going to be rejected. And once she's on the committee... It means she can't vote. So let's assume they are vetting Esla. Yes. That means it's 25 members. Mem NDC has 30. 26. NDC has 12. Mm -hmm. So if she fails to get 14... So if all the NDC... Members vote against, against her, her, she's lost. Are you serious? Yes. That's what the uh, parliament standing orders, what the 172 eight says. We are also told that there are some of the nominees who may face trouble. We'll come to that yes, shortly. Yes, 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 yes. So in terms of the committee, on the MPP side, I can't see a lot of um, firebrands, apart from maybe uh, Apenyo Makin. Yes. And of course, er Esla. obi mm -hmm. is fairly gentle. Yes, he likes to go into the issues, when, especially when the person is a lawyer, or when he has the appointee has got to do, has something got to do with, with the law. So of course, Attorney General, I'm sure he'll be very influential, Deputy Attorney General. He's very much at his best when it comes to you know, these uh, uh, appointments to the Supreme Court, Chief Justice and the rest. Usually he likes to do deal with the mechanics how, of the law. Do we expect it to be combative or as with Parliament, they will do, build consensus in the background and they just come and fight in front of us? From what we've heard, from what we've heard, this is going to be pretty combative because, you know, to move away from the precedence in 2012, when the MPP was in court, their members boycotted vetting. But NDC is saying that if, despite the fact that they are in court, they will not boycott the vetting, they will be there. And I've spoken to a couple of them, believe that they are going to go all out. Again, apart from that, they also have an outstanding issue with the ministers. They say that as at now, they have not cited even one copy of handing over notes I for ministers made that point. in parliament. So because they are relying on these handing over notes, especially those who are carry over ministers, ministers who are continuing to ask them questions based on performance targets that they set for themselves and the real, you know, achievements that they've been able to put across in their work in the past four years. They don't have those documents. If it's been delivered to them now, we, we, we look forward to seeing that Which on Wednesday. Which of the nominees do you expect to face trouble with the committee? How, uh, how, uh, how are Kumsen? Maybe it's how are Kumsen. Number one. How MP Kumsen? for Ewutu Senya. Yes. East. East. And yes. former minister for, for... For special development initiatives. What's her new ministry now? That's fisheries. She's going to the fisheries ministry now. Why would she face problems? Because of how she handled the $1 million per constituency, which is the major plank that was under her, her what do you call it, her, her, her ministry. Most of the MPs have issues regarding that. Oh, so it's not even the, the registration and the shooting? That's, that's also the other side. So the first one is because the $1 million per constituency, they all, right from the register, they complained about the consultation and involvement of members of parliament in that and how projects were being done without their involvement, even though they were supposed to take a greater part of control of however, however those resources were going to be um, distributed. Then there are those who said they never even saw anything like the one million dollars. So there'll be a numbers. lot of that. A lot of that. So how are Kumsin number one? Two, Ken of Oyata, for Ken obvious Oyata. reasons. A Japa deal. Ken Bond, all those issues that came up when, when he went. They'll he, revisit. All those, the common fund, all those issues. Will, there appears will, to be will, no love come lost up. between the finance minister and the NDC in parliament. What, what is the issue there? Is it he doesn't allocate the money early? Why, why do they seem to always give him a hard time? Why does he struggle with them all the time? Well, that's uh, another issue. Is, one issue is we mentioned it rightly, allocation of money. Cause, cause, because there was a time that they almost boycotted um, budget reading proceedings because the common fund had not been released. Mm. That's, that's one issue. Again, they say that, you know, some of them have issues with how he approaches, I mean, the work of, of, being, of being finance minister. Mm. They sometimes think he's not consultative enough. Mm. Even though he speaks to the media a lot, they believe that when it comes to... He doesn't engage them. Engage them, uh, engage them quite So enough. three big issues mm -hmm. you expect Ken to face in his vetting. Yeah. Uh, of course... What, what, what you mean by navigating a, bala a budget through a balanced parliament? And because we see, this is, uh, you see, it's, it's interesting how the last time government budget was rejected in this country, somebody related to his family had something to do with it. So in 1979, um, Professor Bennett's budget was rejected in the Third Republic. Now that was spearheaded by Ken's father and the minority then. That is uh, uh, Dr. Jones, Jones of Oriata. Now we have a parliament that's 137, 137, very tight. And so if they're able to marshal forces on the other side, just as they did with the election of Babu, they can vote they out. They frustrate his budget. Yes, vote out. And you think Ejapa will come up yes, as well? Yes, it will come up because there still are issues. And just last week, we heard that Imara and Africa Legal Associates had completed 
certain documentation with regards to aspects of the deal, which means that it's still on the table. Fantastic. Let's go to the, the flow of the vetting, because I, I'm told that the first minister to be vetted will be the health minister. Yes, the health minister, rightly so, because of COVID. Who is he? Who is Kukwajima Well, Kukwajima Menu is he's an accountant, management accountant. Um, when the president was giving him his marching orders for his first term, it was very clear. One of his key jobs was to restructure the financing component of the National Health Insurance Scheme. And then for one, one, oh, people, people would commend him for... So he was brought in, because don't forget that Kufo, he was deputy finance minister. Finance minister, So yes. he was brought in to deal with the financing, financing issues. aspect of the health insurance because candidate Akufuado in opposition and President Akufuado felt that the NHIS was fast collapsing because of its financial issues. Is so the NHIS the in any, any better health? Uh, well, what's, the the say that the, what's the view of Parliament on NHIS? Well, every time the allocation comes, they, they have issues with it, but then they don't blame him. They blame the finance minister because in 2017, there was a law which was brought, the realignment and capping, capping law which caps statutory payments at 20% of budget, all budgetary allocations, which means that all the monies that are supposed to flow into these statutory funds, DACF, National Health Insurance, can get fund and the rest, are capped at 20%, which means that the money that or, 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 um, originally would have had access to has been capped because of an overarching financial scheme by the finance minister. But as we are told, usually you, you seldom hear the calls that will come from the Christian Health Association of Ghana, the health insurance suppliers and the rest, which means that, of course, he's done quite some good work there. But then COVID struck, and now the whole world is, is trying to do. He himself has been, you know, a, yes. a victim of we'll COVID and all of that. We'll come to his top three. But it's mm -hmm. funny. So he's from Bono's MP for yes. Doma Central. Central. He used to work at Gamot. Yes, worked at uh, Toyota. Director Company. of Finance. Yes. Before he became... Yeah, and he was chairman of Public Accounts Committee. Oh, so, yes. Oh. so yes, he's, yes. Oh, he's, a, he's a management accountant, yes. very... Yeah. Okay, he's, he's a pre-second. You didn't, yeah. you didn't Ah, that. yes, of course. And I'm sure you deliberately, <laughs> because you went to Poco High School, you deliberately left that out. So what are the top three issues you will face? You Status expect? on a promise to build 111 government hospitals. The hospitals? Yes. That's, that's, that is a matter that, especially now that we, we are learning of ICU beds, I mean, getting, uh, getting filled up, the issues of if, I mean, because there were clear timelines that were given by the president when the agenda 100 and. One, one, one so do we know if any of the hospitals have been built at all? The as, 88 as, and as, as, as of now, we, 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 we really can't say. When was the promise made? It was, this was made I mean, somewhere last year. In one of the COVID briefs. one brief. of the COVID briefs. Uh, so it's definitely after March. Updates, yes, Probably after March. around July. July, August. yes. The president said that 88, the districts that do not have hospitals at all. So does hospitals. the vetting allow him to be questioned on, say, the status of the hospital? Every, yes, except when the questions... There are certain rules of engagement. If the chairman thinks that they are going beyond that, then he would come in and say, no, these questions bre uh, breaches the orders and the rules of engagement. So you can't you can, you can go there. So of course, you should express questions on the, on the status of the hospitals. And I'm, and I'm sure, of course, the NMS projects as well will come up. So the abandoned hospital abandoned project, hospital projects, yes, the, the, all, all those issues. Uh, and it, why it, are they vetting the first? Is it because of COVID? Because of COVID. And that... Vaccine uh, rollout. Va that, that was... An express, you know, request that was made by Harun Andrisu, who is ranking member on the committee to the House, that because of whatever is going on, they need to put give priority to certain ministries and certain ministers so that they can quickly be vetted. If they will be approved, approved. If they will be rejected, rejected. So that if they are approved, they can get to the work and, and get it done. Was there a surprise in Parliament when he was renominated by the president? Well, yes, because we, we had heard names apart from him. Insyansari also came up. Quite strongly, we heard that he was going to be nominated. So it's one of the names that quite, you know, showed quite an amount. The of president's people. advisor. Yes, yes, yes. But he, here he is. After he did a good job, so the president thinks he should continue. Okay, let's talk about another minister and another po position. So health will be vetted first. Yes, first. Followed we'll by first. who? Um, finance is also in there. National security is also in there. National security. And then education is also in there. These are those are the four. We'll come to education yeah. shortly. So uh, Kandapa is the man. Yeah. Don't forget, Ajima Menu is 65 years mm -hmm. old from BA. Yeah. Uh, who is this man? <laughs> Kandapa, 67. Uh, he's, he's from Ashanti, he's from Afijakwabri. Mm -hmm. from, he was, was MP, was part of the MPs that came into parliament in 96. He actually used to the chair the committee the, uh, the that Ajima Menu used to chair. Yeah, so so he, it's a committee for the accountants. So he, um, Ajima Menu became chairman after Kandapa. So they are both chartered accountants. B both, both chartered accountants. Uh, he held various min ministerial portfolios and that before energy, communications, and then later became defense, defense and interior minister. And Will we be able to follow this vetting? If they do not, if it doesn't raise any concern that because they are matters of national security, they need to be held in camera. 
it would be life public. Have we seen world. previous national security ministers vetted in the open before? He was vetted in, in the open. Yes, he was were there portions that were held in camera though? He, at a point in time, some of them will raise those concerns, but, but the chairman felt that so they were not. They were not what are the enough. top questions he will face in his vetting? Well, we are expecting the issues of the secessionists. Okay. Togoland is not gone away. Western we, Togoland. Western Togoland. Those issues would come up. Mm -hmm. uh, national intelligence and, age, uh, and its agencies. We have a new law. The National Security and Intelligence Act is, is being. It has been rolled out. It's now functioning. Mm. He will be asked questions with, with, with regards to that. There's, the BNI has changed its name to NIB, National Intelligence Bureau, its functions and all of those. And, of course, militia groups. Will, will he face key. any controversial personal questions? Uh, may, well, maybe. Maybe. Maybe on the lighter side. Maybe. Okay. A lot of people were excited in social media yes. about this guy. Yes, 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 yes. Why is he so popular? Second term MP, um, he seems to have a very full grasp of his brief. He was deputy education minister, but he was seen as very engaging, has a mastery of the area, and he came, he, he came to that position with a very rich portfolio. I mean, you're a, 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 well, a black, for want of a better word, a black man who left Ghana after his land, land economy degree from tech, went to the United States, did two degrees, master's and a PhD in educational policy management, owns charter schools in the United States. You know, for, 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 for a Ghanaian to be able to do that, and it's, one, what, it's rated as one of the best schools. So his in PhD is in education policy. policy. Yes. Which is what a minister of education does. Does. Educational policy. Educational policy. Yes, and that is what um, he, he, he did. And, and as deputy minister, a lot of people believe that it is ideas that double track for him. Everybody knows that he is the brain behind. Oh, he, he yes. is just his idea? Uh, yes, double track. Oh, really? This idea, you should hear him on 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 on, on, oh, wow. on, on double track. So I'm sure he will, he will be asked a lot of questions with regards to that. and the sheer clarity with which he communicates on education, and even how he he came here to teach mathematics. Yes, yes, and which he does. You know, <laughs> once in a while you see him walk into a JHS classroom, an SHS classroom, mm. and, and he owns two schools in Ghana. He owns a school, two senior high schools in Ghana. That now is that not conflict of interest? Girls, now it's it's in government. It's, it's handed it over to government. But some three girls and then another school in his constituency. And recently, he was celebrated while he has a project that is training hundred engineers in his constituency. Which constituency is this? This is Bosumche, in the Ashanti region. Bosumche. He's training hundred engineers. One hundred engineers for over the next four so years. So you don't expect him to face any problems. He will have to answer questions about, obviously, about the reopening of schools and COVID. You have questions okay. to answer about the double track system. You have questions about free SHS. You have questions about the controversial public universities bill. So he would have, and then of course, he will be running an education ministry that probably won't have a minister of state for education as his former boss, Napu, had. He wouldn't have, probably will just run with another deputy. We've had certain... And this is a big And ministry. education is big. I mean, even if you just look at the just running component of only teachers, that's a huge, you know. So you think SHS, free SHS will come up, double yes, track, double COVID, track and COVID and schools? schools. Public investors will come up. Mm. Yeah. Ayariga proposed government absorption of university fees. That would also fees. come up. You think because, Ayariga because will take him on because on Because he argued forcefully against that on the floor of parliament. So it's going to come up? Yeah, yes, he'll be asked. But you expect him to go that. through? Of course. And, and one thing I must make clear is that they have a certain, you know, um, I won't say soft spot, but there's a certain affinity for their colleagues who appear before the committee. And oh. that has been. So it's likely you would not face any challenges if you're an MP than you are, if you are an, an outsider. Oh, yes. so, so, oh, wow. Yes. So, Ejaku previously, Ken and Co. Yes, they so, were not MPs. So, this is solidarity among MPs? Well, you would say so, because how Akum Sen, how Akum Sen's vetting lasted barely for 30 minutes. When he, the first time you... Wow. Yeah. So, we should expect him to sail through. Yes. Amazing stuff. Yeah. This is still the point of view. Um, as you can tell, we're, we're trying to do a lot of things within a short period of time, because we know you guys are very busy. So, we want to walk you through some more ministries... Some ministers who will be uh, appearing, or minister nominees who will be appearing before the vetting committee. This is a part one. We'll probably do a part two after the first vetting. So vetting is on Wednesday, right? Yes, yeah, starts on Wednesday. We will take a short break. We'll come back and tell you more about some other people who will be appearing before the vetting committee with my man, Duke Mensa Opoku, walking us through. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is The Point of View. A double barrel show started off talking about the election petition. Big day in court on Tuesday. We'll be there live. And on Wednesday, 
vetting of Minitian nominees. For the first time, 1313, and some members of the vetting committee are also going to be vetted. I think Napo is also on the committee. Yes, yes, yes. Napo is on so the committee. Matthew Poku Prempe, Shanti Royal, former Minister for Education, Education. moved to an equally weighty. Yes. Very. So is it for. I'm just wondering, okay, if you don't work at the president, but mm -hmm. is this like a. An untouchable in the Kufado government. In well, he, 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 well, for, I mean, let's start from even the 20, 2017 appointment. Many people thought he was going to, because of his background as, as a med surgeon. medicine and surgeon, he was going to be made health minister. And when you should hear him communicate on COVID, it was very good, great understanding. Clarity. And, and all of this. People thought he was going to be, but he was sent to education ministry. And for many, he has delivered on free SHS. So, energy is also another, it's a huge, it's, a, it's one of the ministries that I've seen. Just a, a, I mean, few changes. Unlike most of the other ministries in that A-list ministries, where I've seen a lot of stability across the board. So energy ministry, Napo is going there. Um, maybe the magic that he worked at education, as um, to be able being able to roll out free SHS, a lot of quiet on the labor front with regards to teachers and other things. Probably he'll be able to take that there. So, I, I mean. But does he know energy? I don't know what... I don't, you know, I mean, that's, that's one of the questions... You know, that, is that going to come that's, up in the That's vetting? one of the questions that people raise because we've had very highly technical people at the energy ministry um, in a coup for advice. He's a banker. Banker, finance. And energy is finance. Finance, ex, all that, with Bank of, uh, Bank of America, New York, and, and all of that. And then I mean, who ran, who has a master's in uh, petroleum economics and um, he energy... He was running with, Africa Center uh, for, for Energy Policy. policy with Amin. Uh, with Amin, before he... he, he so. These are people who are very highly skilled professionals in that field. There's a medical doctor who's worked as education minister being trusted. But let, let's see. I mean, people say that uh, as a minister, all you need is a very good, a very good backroom setup. Unless he will be appointed as his deputy. What kind of questions will Napo face at the committee? Of course, energy sector debt is, is an issue that he will, he will face, eliminating doom so, of course, which is strongly linked with the energy sector uh, debt. Closure on PDS debacle, as of now, is still hanging. And then leveraging Ghana's, Ghana's oil. Because unlike uh, previously where um, the electricity or power was separated from petroleum, and the Akufuado's government, petroleum and power all together. So it's a huge ministry. ministry. Yes, very, very huge ministry, which used to have three deputies. And uh, when um, um, Amewu, under the previous administration, were three deputies, one in charge of power, uh, generation, the other in charge of finance, and the other in charge of petroleum. Wow, it's a huge, so, it's a huge ministry. Huge ministry. Okay, now let's talk about some other ministries like uh, lands and natural resources. So yes. this was the ministry Peter Mewu used to run. Yes, before, before he was sent to the ministry. Energy. Of, I don't think he was promoted. Well, before he was in the ministry of ministry and then of Treme energy, yes, took over then, this ministry. Yeah, Asuma Treme took over from he moved from Bruno Afo to become minister. Who's going to be the minister here? One of the president's trusted aides from his days in opposition, one of the Jinapo brothers, um, wow. Samuel Abdullah Jinapo, by medical physics uh, background and law. So, um, w w and of course, I mean, uh, the training in law gives you a, a broad-based, you know, understanding of a lot of things. So this guy is a full minister? Yes, yes, and he's engaged as the parliamentary press corps, spoken about how he intends to deal with Galamsey, how he intends to deal with land administration in the country. And he seems to have is there, is there a brilliant sense, ideas. Is there a sense in which the NDC and MPP seem to be competing with the two brothers because the elder brother was John Mohammed's spokesperson, yes. became deputy energy minister. minister. He's, he's quite respected in mm -hmm. parliament, but yes. this guy is now former chief of staff, full, full minister. minister. Yes, yes, and he's yes. younger. Yes, and he's younger. And he's one of the, 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 the younger brother. Seems, seems, seems to have proved his mettle as deputy chief of staff under um, Akofo Ado. That's why, and of course, he won a very, won into a very difficult race for the Damango seat. A lot of people wrote him off, said, I mean, he, he didn't have any strong traditional links or traditional roots in that constituency, so he couldn't win. But he proved everybody wrong. Won with, a, with quite a sizable margin, beat Adam Muto Akilu, and now he's Minister for Lands and Natural Resources. Wow. So and he's under 40. So you, you think the president has a special reason for putting him for there? For putting him there, yes. Amazing. Because Lance is huge. You can't talk about uh, Jinapo without talking about his uh, colleague. His twin. Political twin. Yeah. Yes, uh, Francis Asensu Wache. Um, uh, Sorry, will Jinapo face any problem in the committee? How he would problems? I I I doubt. You doubt it. I doubt because some way somehow he kept a very. Is his brother on the committee? His brother is not on the, He's committee. Not on the committee. Some way somehow he kept quiet. With the exception of some issues at Kolebu, 
He kept quite a low profile as a deputy chief of staff. So you don't expect any mm, major I don't challenges? Really expect, I don't expect any huge challenges. Uh, likewise, he's someone who, who doesn't really talk much. He, he has a very um, dark personality, but he's an achiever, right? From You're talking about at, this guy? Yes, Asen Subwachi, right from his days at KNUST. He will forever be remembered for setting up Tescon. He was the founding he president. He set up Tescon? Yes, founding president really? of Tescon. The NPP wing students. He, he's the founding he's president? He's the founding president. KNUST, he said that. He I'm seems to be highly regarded by the... Yeah, Kofu had a long-serving political assistant. Um, wow. Yes, yes, yes. A Rotary Fellow, went, went, went to Michigan State University. And his forte is in policy and research and planning. That's what he's but been... But this ministry was run by Atachi. Atachi. Omar Sander interviewed him. Yeah. He says he didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. There are so many problems facing yes. the ministry. What kind of questions will he face? Ghana's housing deficit is something that he would have to obviously... You obviously would have to, yes, housing deficit, Saglemi would come up. Implementation of the rental uh, assistance scheme. And they course, promised this in the, in the... In the manifesto, how that is going to be done. Because consistently, for a ministry that sometimes you have... I mean, consistently, in the four years of a governance, you have people like Harna and Dusu Samson here and the rest, always advocating for the finance minister to vote more money for the Ministry of Works and Housing. Because there are locations that were going to the US, of course, to complain about it, especially for the maintenance of of public works. For the housing aspect, Atachi has started a couple of things, a rent scheme, the national housing policy, and the, the, new, the new law, real estate law, which has been passed and they are mm. here to implement it. So that's but is Atachi on the committee? Atachi for some, was a long-standing member of the committee, but interestingly, and we, need, we may require some answers, this time around he's not on the committee, sadly. Yes, Alan Tremating, start of the new patriotic party. Um, Lawyer, we understand some idea. people were saying the president made his appointments on the basis of people who were not interested in competing for 2024. It came up, it came up, but, so, but how come because we've seen but people he has already? Not, he has not, unlike we are told that, for instance, someone like Jogate was not appointed because he had publicly declared that he would contest. So, Alan hasn't has publicly, not publicly declared. even though you've seen, even though we've seen the people are running out, people are sort of you know doing all the groundwork and see publicly. Has not said that he will run for 20. He's not an MP. Alan H never how, been an how MP. is he seen in parliament? Alan is well respected. I um, mean, he's, 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 uh, he's, he's, he enjoys respect from, from all sides of the aisle. With the exception of the cash receipt issue, which was involved, he's kept public, um, in parliament and uh, also has kept, I mean, generally a good, clean profile of himself as a politician as a, and as a, public, uh, as, as a public servant over the years. So, uh, I mean, I don't. I don't of course, cash for seats once again will come up. Once he's at the committee, they ask him. people would want to, you know, raise all those issues again. Do they, what, what does NDC think about 1D1F? Be that, 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 I mean, people, people believe it's generally a regurgitation and revitalization of old projects. And there are people on the committee who think that 1D1F is, is, a, is, is something which was the um, rural enterprise project that John Mahama was trying to, Implement so, so you, should, you face some questions. So you then. face questions about, especially with the old factories that are being, you know, brought back to life under the guise of one D one. So all those questions, he will, he will, he will face that. After there are a lot of people on the committee who would also want to hear about how Ghana Ghana will benefit, especially with the local content aspect of it. Let's end with the Ministry for Interior, and this man Ambrose, Ambrose Derry. Derry. Yes. You notice a lot of the people are in their sixties. Yes. Yes. Kanda is in his 60s. The first, uh, uh, Ajima Menu is in his 60s. 60s. Alan Chermanti in his 60s. Uh, Interior Minister in his 60s. In so, fact, when we did, the, we did the analysis, the mood, as in the commonest yeah. age, I think it was 65. Yeah. But there yeah. are quite a number who are below yeah, 50, yeah. 60. Yeah. So just, so maybe an age, age. So this is, a, who is this guy, lawyer? That's, that's uh, Ambrose Derry, lawyer, former deputy minority leader. Um, he, he's uh, handled this portfolio for the, for the past, past four years. So, so nothing new there. Yeah. So policing and, and crime you don't rate, expect him to face any crime big rate, problems. Um, recruitment into the police service and mm. other. I um, mean, okay. Parliament is sitting arrest. twice a week. Yes. So where are they going to do the, the, with the vetting? The vetting will happen in the speaker's conference in, room where this happens. In camera? No, uh, live. It will happen live. Live, yes. Amazing. Yes. I'm told that the other ministry that will come up is this one. Yes, defense. Yes, that's okay. also another. In one. In the first week. In the first week, defense will also defense will also come up. Dominic Niti came to Parliament. At the time to replace um, Ibn Chambas. At the age he of was 25. 25. He was the youngest MP then. Lost his seat, went to build up himself capacity, and then came back 
and won his seat again. It was also Will deputy, he face any serious deputy problems? Deputy minority. Well, on, things have largely been quiet, with the exception of the recruitment of persons that people on the minority believe are vigilantes into the military. So, so it's that's an issue we would have to. That's an issue. And of course, what happened on the morning of 7th of January? The, the military men that some think, or I've heard some members of parliament say that they came onto the floor of parliament based on his orders, even Ooh. though at the time he wasn't ministry. He so it's going to be hot. He would definitely have to answer. And then on our borders. Yes, the borders. The, the, the um, I mean, what do you call it? Deployment of soldiers at the various borders. Um, some for, as some say for COVID reasons, others said to intimidate people during the voting and the rest. So he'll have to answer uh, all those questions. So we should definitely follow the proceedings. Yes, it will be very interesting. Very, 13, very interesting. 13. It will be sometimes long, drawn out, tiring, but it'll be very interesting. With COVID protocols being observed, yes. you'll be there. Yes. I'm sh I'm, I was still parliament tested. How many MPs were positive? 15 MPs. 15 MPs. And still ongoing. I mean, um, today there was testing. Friday, we all got tested, members of the parliamentary okay. press call. So we are waiting what, what our fate will be. Thank you. Good luck to you. That was the Duke Mensa Opoku. Uh, we believe you've enjoyed the show. We've been trying to do a lot of things at the same time because these days there's no time. I'm sure you guys are very busy, but we thank you so much for watching. Initially, I had Sixtus Dong Ulo, who's uh, one of our legal correspondents, to walk us through day 11 of the election petition on Tuesday morning. We're there from 9.30. And then on Wednesday, we're going into parliament for the vetting. In all, 25 ministers? Yes. 25 ministers yeah. who have been nominated. Deputy ministers and others will follow later. My name is Bernard Avle. Thank you so much for watching The Point of View. We'll be with you. See you next time. Bye-bye.